Uh, if you've got your Bibles, open up to the book of uh, Revelation. We are still moving in that uh, book. We've been talking about the reigning king, and uh, man, I'm going to tell you something. We, I got to looking last night. We've been in Revelation, uh, this section of Revelation, the reigning king, since the second Sunday of this year, in, beginning in January. And so we still have a little bit more to go. Uh, some of you may remember it's been uh, over a year ago that we uh, did a series called Seven, where we walked through chapter two and chapter three of Revelation about the seven churches. And so if you've not walked through this, if you're brand new to us and you're just now kind of uh, jumping in, uh, I would encourage you to go back and you catch up. And uh, it, it, I don't know how long it'll take you. It'll take a little bit. Uh, but I would encourage you to start listening. In fact, some, someone asked me the other day, we do have a podcast. So if you're a podcast person going back and forth to work, uh, you can find LifePoint Church Riverdale Campus, and you can uh, follow along with those, and you can uh, listen and listen and catch up and uh, be a part of all that we've been studying. Revelation uh, is typically not a book that people just want to necessarily dive in. They do like to hear about the end time stuff, but when you start jumping into it, for a lot of people, it can become very scary. It can become confusing because there's there's beasts, there's dragons, there's wrath, there's bowls, there's uh, these angels, these creatures, and what does all this mean? And you see these uh, all kinds of different uh, allusions to things. There's a lot of uh, different passages that refer back to the Old Testament that we really don't even understand many times if we're not really looking for those types of things, and it can be scary. My hope is, is that through Revelation, this, as we're walking through it, you're finding hope. I have heard some of you say, boy, this has been very hopeful, but when we begin, when we begin to realize who John was writing to and that he was writing to a group of people who had been facing oppression and who were still facing oppression uh, from the government from the Roman government, that so much so that if they didn't bow their knee to Rome, if they didn't bow their knee to uh, the, the, the doctrines of the day, the philosophies of the day, they could lose their job, they could lose their head, they could be dipped in a, in a pot of boiling oil as John, the Apostle John, was, or exiled off to a, 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 to a place uh, where he wrote uh, on the Isle of Patmos that he wrote. So my hope, as he was writing to the church, the church is, those seven churches, and to us, to bring hope to us in the, in the face of what we're in, I'm hopeful that you, uh, that you have found hope. I'm hopeful that this has not been a scary book to you, but it's been one that where you've begun to go, man, I'm learning a lot. I'm learning a lot as we walk through this. But we're taking a turn now in Revelation 19. Uh, you know, um, not all football games are really exciting in the fourth quarter, but a fourth quarter football game that is really tight, really intense, gets the blood boiling, kind of like it did last week with Seattle. If you remember that, if you were Titans at Titans in Seattle, well, we're kind of taking the turn here. We're moving into the fourth quarter. We're getting to the part of Revelation that believers love, or we should love. This is, we're moving from, from uh, war to victory, we're, I mean, like, we're getting into the part where we're going to see heaven. And that begins today in Revelation chapter 19. And I'm really, really excited about it. The title of the message today is The Win and the Wedding. The Win and the Wedding. And they're going to see two points today, two big points. The first one is this, is that we're going to see the celebration of the win. And then we're W-I-N. And then we're going to see the celebration of the wedding, because the marriage feast of the Lamb, the wedding supper of the Lamb, is what we're all longing to see as believers. And so with that, let's start reading in Revelation. We're not going to read all of 19 today. We're going to slow down a little bit. And we're going to be in Revelation 19, verses 1 through 10. John is writing, and for most theologians, most commentators, and just to give you a little uh, uh, aside here, we'll tell you... Uh, and let me give you another aside to the aside. You realize that these chapters and verses are put in by man. This is not how John wrote it. This was a letter, all right? And so the, the chapters and the number verses and all of those came in much later. Well, most theologians will tell you that chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, really probably goes best in with chapter 18. It's a continuation of chapter 18. And so with that, let's 
Keep reading. You remember last week as we talked about in chapter 18, you began to see the destruction of Babylon itself. And so with that, we pick up in verse 1. It says this, And after this I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of, the ser- uh, of his servants. Once more, they cried out, hallelujah. You, if there's an exclamation point, you got you to gotta go with it, all right? The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. And from the throne came a great voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Verse 6, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and the sound of of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the, the Almighty Rains. Now, if you've been around here any time, you know that I'm always asking you to take out a piece of pen, a piece of paper, something, grab that Connect card on the back. It's, clear, it's white. You've got room. Type some notes in. Uh, uh, whenever you see words repeated, it's very, very important. And so what word did you hear repeated in here over and over? Oh, gosh, that's not the way it was written. What? Ah, thank you. Hallelujah. Listen, I think it's really important that you catch this. That word hallelujah means praise the Lord. It means praise the Lord, all right? And as often as you see it in songs, as often as you see it uh, and you hear people talk about it, do you realize that there's only four places in the New Testament, only four places in the New Testament where that word is? You know where that is? Right here. We've just read the four places. So we've just read in the New Testament the only place where hallelujah is, right here in Revelation. So this is huge because what you're seeing right here is literally a song of victory. They are crying out. Listen, in sports world today, and, um, you know, I'm, I, I like sports. I don't go crazy over them. I like all sports. I, I'm learning to like hockey. Uh, I grew up in Texas, so football was really big to me. Uh, soccer, moving over, the, the, as the world would say, the real football. Uh, when I moved to Europe, soccer became really, really big to me to be able to follow along. And you, you realize, don't you, that sports teams, the competition for most sports teams and sports fans isn't just about the score. It's more than that. Nowadays in America, it's about the stadium. You've noticed this, all the new stadiums being built with all the different amenities, all the things that you can go do. Now now then, it's a destination point. Uh, But another huge, huge competition is the sound. It's, I mean, that's, that's huge. To have the loudest stadium is a big, big deal. Uh, I'm from Texas. I'm an A&M fan. I'm sorry. We got beat really bad yesterday. Uh, I was going back and forth with Carl on, uh, on text, walking through. We got beat by Arkansas. You know, the 12th man began at the University of Texas A&M, uh, and the 12th man is all about, the, at, at an Aggie game, everyone stands the entire game. And they are called the 12th man because they have to be ready because back long, 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 I don't know, back in the 20s or the 30s or something, uh, they had a player go down and somebody from the crowd jumped in and took over and, he, and, and took his place so that they would have enough people to play. So ever since then, they've been called the 12th man. And you stand through the entire football game. Well, the Seattle, uh, the, the Seattle Seahawks are called the 12th man in the, in the NFL, because the fans are all into it. I think it was back in 2013, they set the record as the loudest stadium. Something like 132 decibels or something like 137 decibels. I don't, that's loud. That's loud. For those of you who are worried, we don't run that in here, all right? I need you to know that. But it was only like the very next year in Kansas City at Arrowhead Stadium, open air stadium, Arrowhead, 2014, 140 two decibels, 142 decibels. Listen, that's almost three times what the human ear can stand. 
I was listening to somebody this week talk about being in the stadium, and they were saying that they had their hands up to their wife's ear, and she could not even hear them them talking. That's with like 75,000 people. I, I need you to catch this. I need you. What we read about here in chapter 19, verses 1 through 6, is going to make Arrowhead Stadium sound like a library. It's going to sound like a library because they are celebrating a great, great win. What is the great win? Well, chapter 18, Babylon has fallen. Babylon is gone. It's over. Some of you may, if you've just stepped in here and you're wondering, what in the world is Babylon? Babylon was, in chapter 18, the, 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 the prostitute who was riding on the beast that was being used by the, by the great dragon, by the beast, by the seven kings. Babylon is the world philosophies, the doctrines, the governments. It's the false religions. Babylon is what the false prophet utilizes to seduce the church and the people not to follow after Christ. And here what we see is that God himself, Jesus, vanquished Babylon, and now all of heaven goes crazy. They, the win is done. It is over. It's finished. Look with me at chapter 19 again, and I want you to see verses, uh, the end of verse 1. At the end of verse 1, they cry out, Hallelujah. Why do they cry out hallelujah? Praise the Lord. They cry out because it says this. He says, salvation. Salvation. I'm going to break it apart. Salvation belongs to our God. Did you realize that your salvation comes directly from God? You don't earn it. You can't win it. You can't do anything for it except receive the gift, Romans tells us, of our salvation. I'm going to ask you this. Those of you who are believers in here, uh, what's the last thing? What's the last thing God saved you from? Where have you been? What has your situation been where you realize all of a sudden, if God does not move in, if Jesus doesn't move into this, I'm sunk. Can you think about not just when you were saved? I hope that you can go back and remember when Jesus Christ saved you. You may not remember the exact date. I don't, I'll be honest with you, I don't remember the exact date. I do know the time frame. I was 13 years old. I remember the scenarios around it, but I don't remember the exact date. But I can see it, and I know that Jesus saved me. He changed me. Can you remember that? If you don't remember a time where Jesus has saved you, my prayer, we prayed for you this morning that Jesus would save you today, that he would change, that he would invade your life today, and you would be changed forever. Let me ask you, believer, can you remember the last time? Not only were you saved, but we're still being saved. When's the last time that you can look back and go, Jesus intercepted, and he stepped in, in my life? I mean, listen, if it wasn't for him, Can you remember that time? Listen, if you can't remember that time today between here and the end of lunch, I'm asking that you be thinking about that because I want you at lunch today. I want you at lunch to be able to say, hey, I remember when Jesus did this. You remember in our family, if it had not been for Jesus, this would, uh, listen, I'm asking, we've got to rehearse those things. We've got to think about those things. Because I I told John Key, called him out, I told John Key last Sunday, you know, one 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 of the things that happens with believers many times is that we don't give Jesus enough time to move in to save something and change it. We're so busy as believers many times, when we come up against something, we just turn to the next scheme of Babylon and think, okay, I'm going to jump into here. And we don't even realize it's the scheme of Babylon, because it looks like the next thing. This is how he's going to save me. Listen, we've got to stop as church, as believers, and just wait. Jesus, I need you. There is, my financial advisor is not going to fix this. My, I don't even know if my doctor is going to fix this. I don't know if, my, if I can fix my child. I don't know if my boss is going to do this. Jesus, I need you. We need salvation today. Listen, Why were they saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah, because salvation belongs to our God. He says, listen, glory, hallelujah, glory belongs to our God. You know what glory is, don't you? Glory is defined as the weight. You know when you're weighing something? 
the, the weight, the intensity of something. Like we really want our money to outweigh our bills, don't we? Amen. That ought to be an amen. I mean, we really want that. Uh, listen, the weight of God should be so great in our life that we, it, it's just his glory, everything about him, all of his character, every, his entire essence, his beauty, his majesty, his righteousness, his holiness, his wrath, his, his mercy. That is all the sum total of who God is, is his glory in our life. And it overwhelms us. Why were they singing hallelujah? Because of the glory of the God, the glory, all glory belongs to God. It says all power belong to God. His judgments, they are true and just. You realize that when God intervenes in, in our lives and he saves us, his ways become true and right, even though we don't necessarily understand them. Uh, listen, broken record, I'm just telling you, this is why as a follower of Jesus, we say this word is correct. We may not understand all of it, but God, I submit myself to it. I come under it, and I trust it because your judgments are true and right. Hallelujah, your judgments are true, and they are right. And no matter what, I'm going to follow them. They also cry out, hallelujah. It says, for the smoke of Babylon goes up forever. Did you realize in chapter 17, look back over in chapter 17, 17, 6. In chapter 17, verse 6, it's, it's already said that Babylon is going to be burned up by the kings and by the beasts. And now you're seeing in 19, this is what's happened. That's why we're crying out hallelujah. Listen, we, 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 as, a fo as followers of Christ, when we come in here, we come distracted. I get it. I get it. You, you may have gotten in an argument or a, or a heavy discussion with your spouse this morning. You came in distracted. You may have had car trouble. You came in distracted. You and your kids may have had something going on. You came in distracted. You didn't get your Dunkin' Donuts on the way in today because you were running late because your kids distracted you and you had a, a tussle with your wife or something, your spouse. You're distracted, but I need you to hear. There's going to be a day when there will be absolutely no more distractions. No more bank issues, no more finance issues, no more addiction issues, no more spousal issues, no, no more anything. It will be when we are before the throne, when Babylon has been destroyed, the smoke of her has gone up, and we're going to cry out, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Do I have a hallelujah here today? This is what we're going to get to see. Folks, I'm telling you, I told the team this morning, I'm excited because we've been in judgment. We're talking about consummation now. We are going to see Jesus one day, and we're going to cry out. I was reading a, a message this week by uh, John Piper about this passage, and I like what he said. He is a master with words. He talked about our worship as a church. Our worship as a church, it, it, it should be fragrant a sweet aroma to God, and it should be flagrant. I thought those were two good words. Listen, in, in football world, when the, when the yellow flag comes in and they call you a flagrant foul, that means it was an obvious, it was hard, it was an attack. Do you realize what our worship is when we come together, when we celebrate, when we come together to celebrate the win, we are standing here each and every Sunday. It should be a flagrant attack to the world, to Babylon. You don't have me. You do not have me. When the entire world is going to be going to hell in a handbasket, not me. I'm standing right here. This is where I stand. Hallelujah, Lord. Your ways, your true, your righteous, your glory goes to you, God. Hallelujah. And you know what? When we do that, and we sing, and we worship him for who he is, that is a fragrant aroma to him. It's a fragrant aroma. Did you notice, uh, I believe it was uh, Zeke, in case you don't know, that was Zeke, that's not Zion, that's his twin brother, that was Zeke. 
All right. I think Zeke said it's going to be like multitudes. Who are those multitudes? Well, the, the passage tells us this. It says that the creatures, the 24 elders, fell down around. We know that there are angels. Remember back earlier in, chapter, in Revelation, it talks about myriads upon myriads. Thousands upon thousands, ten thousands upon ten thousands. We also know this, that it says there at the end of 6, it tells us this that, um, that it, there's going to be multitudes like the roaring waters from every people, every language, every tribe, every nation. Do you remember what Jesus, what, excuse me, what God promised Abraham back in Genesis? He said, your offspring is going to be as numerous as the sand of the sea, the stars of the sky. Folks, we think oftentimes that heaven it, there's going to be just people, there's just going to be like, like a marble just rolling around in heaven. There's just so few people. Folks, I need you to hear, it's going to be packed. There's going to be people everywhere. This is not like small little podunk town in Far East Texas. This is going to be a packed place with believers. I was looking last night. I'm, I'm, uh, most estimates... I don't know how they figure all this and go back, but I went to several different places to kind of... Do you know, m many people believe, specialists in these types of things, I guess demographers, that there have been since, uh, since the beginning of time are over 107 billion people who have inhabited the world. 107 billion. That's a lot. Still not up to our debt here in the United States, but that's another story. Uh, we, I mean, there is 107 billion people. I don't know how many people are going to be in heaven. I do know it won't be 107 billion because I'm not a universalist. The only people who go to heaven are those who have surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. What I do know, based on the Word of God, is that it's going to be packed. There's going to be so many people. And you know what? The volume, that roar that the scripture talks about, it won't be because the decibels have been turned up on a sound system. You know what the, you know what the roar is going to be? It's going to be all of us. If, if 70,000 people can get in a compact area and scream, go Chiefs, when all of the millions upon millions, billions of people enter heaven who have surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ, and they begin to say, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lord. It's going to be raucous. And we need to get in on that today. You know, at A&M, they all do a thing on, on uh, Friday night. It's called yell practice, midnight, midnight yell, where they go and they get fired up. Folks, that's what this needs to be. When we gather, we come here to say, listen, uh, nothing's stopping us. Yes, today, this week has been tough, but today I'm proclaiming that God is alive, that Jesus is alive, that he is still reigning, and that there is hope in the midst of what I face today because Jesus is on the throne. So they've gathered to celebrate the win. Look at the second thing. They're gathered to celebrate the wedding. They've gathered to celebrate the wedding. Let's read in verses 7 through 10. Revelation 9, 19, 7 through 10. It says this, let us rejoice and exalt. Now, real quick, exalt is a, a word that means to praise. It's elation, but it's in reference to a triumph that has happened. Why are they exalting? Because Babylon is burning up, gone up in smoke. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Verse 9. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who were invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are, true, are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This is one of the reasons that I really love, love, love Scripture. Is because if I were John, I probably would not have put my mistake in there. All right? This, this goes to the validity. 
John says, listen, he, remember John, he got, kind of, he got caught up in the beast. It says he was, uh, he was, uh, he was kind of amazed. They, oh, no, back over here. It says here that John fell down at the, at the angel's feet and began to worship. He said, no, 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 get up, get up, get up. You worship God and worship him alone. Only worship him. Heaven rejoices, yes, because there's a great win, but, he also, but heaven also goes crazy because there is a wedding. For the last several weeks, at least the last two chapters, we've kind of focused on uh, the prostitute, Babylon. And now then the scene shifts and the focus goes towards the bride, the bride of Christ. Do you remember where Jesus' very first miracle was? Anybody remember that? It was in Cana at a wedding where he turned water into the finest wine, it says. That should not surprise you that his very first miracle was at a wedding because his whole ministry was leading towards his own wedding. Everything about it is for us to get to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's what it's all been preparing for. Weddings in that day were very different from, the de- from our days. They were arranged. So... Dad would arrange a marriage with another dad, and they would agree, and they would have a time set aside where where the the guy, the groom, would go to the house. He would make a proposal. It, It was kind of a formality. It would be accepted, and in that, he would provide a gift, a dowry, and then they would enter into a betrothal. During the betrothal, they were legally married, but they could not consummate, and that 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 betrothal could take a period of time. We don't know exactly how, but many times it was around a year. The only way they could have gotten out of that was a divorce, a certificate of divorce. At the time of the wedding, when it would happen, there would be a huge feast. Many times, if depending on the size of the village, it may be the entire village that comes out to celebrate that. Those wedding feasts, those wedding parties that happen, in many instances, uh, history tells us they were around, uh, somewhere around seven days that they, they could last, depending on uh, the, the financial ability of the people involved and how that would happen. Well, I, Jesus, I want you to know, he chose his bride, us, before the foundation of the world. You realize that, don't you? He chose us as his bride before the foundation of the world. The betrothal happened when he came to earth, and he inaugurated that. He paid the dowry for you and me. Do you know how? By laying his life down on a cross so that we might have a relationship with him. And at the predetermined time, I can't tell you when it's going to be, Only God himself knows. We know that Jesus is going to come back and he's going to take us home to consummate that wedding and there will be a feast like no other. That is why we celebrate. That is why they were celebrating. Now, I want to tell you, I've had three weddings. Not me personally, excuse me. Let me make sure. (laughs) I've had one wedding, me personally. But we've celebrated three weddings in our house. We, I have uh, two sons, and I have a daughter. And they happen back to back to back. Like, uh, in three summers, we had three kids. Our three kids get married. Listen, when, when, sons, when sons get married, uh, you get rich because you end up getting another daughter, and you're going to get some grandkids down the road and all those things. When a daughter gets uh, married, you get spent. I'm just telling you. All right? It doesn't matter if it is a son or a daughter, though. Weddings are incredible. They are beautiful. They're so much fun. They are a celebration. Listen, uh, 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 having a daughter get married uh, and watching all that went into that, I'm getting a little nervous thinking about it again, but I mean, she had invite lists. She had dresses she's trying to figure out. She had uh, food that she's worried about, she, uh, you know, shoes, hair, makeup, this and this and this, photo booths. I mean, and there, there were all kinds of things. Uh, listen, for the guy, you know what the guy's worried about? Nothing. <laughs> guy's worried about nothing. He, where's the video games? Where ESPN? Pass the Doritos. <laughs> Anybody got some gum before I take these vows? The only thing he's worried about is the wedding night. That's all that he's worried about at all, right? <laughs> got an amen. That was a little bit. Listen, it is an incredible, incredible experience to see these lives coming together. 
My daughter was so excited about those days. She, listen, everything about her changed. Listen, when, when my son-in-law's name is Kyle, so when Kyle number one had to step back and Kyle number two had to come in, she was no longer worried about pleasing me. She was worried about pre- pleasing the groom. The way she looked, the way she dressed, everything. She wanted to make herself ready for that groom. Do you notice what the scripture told us here? Do you notice what the scripture said? It says that, number one, well, you see a couple of things here that I want to make sure that you catch real quick. There are two big theological points here that you need to see. Number one, it's salvation and it's sanctification. Salvation and sanctification. Salvation is this. It says it was granted to her, this bride. Look with me if if you see this. I want you to, uh, in verse 8, and it was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. That's the salvation that is given given to you and I if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. You are now a part of the bride. It was given to you. But it also says, now if you keep going down, I want you to see this. It says, and the angel said, right, blessed are those, excuse me, fine linen. It says it was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Now wait, some of you may go, now wait, was it granted to her or did her righteous deeds? No, it was both and. It was both and. Jesus Christ gave me my purity. He gave that to me. I could not earn that. But in sanctification, becoming more like Jesus, I also have to clothe myself to become more like Christ. I'm working so that I can look like Jesus, so I can present myself wholly unto him holy unto him. Listen, I don't work for my salvation, but I do work because of my salvation. Some of us in here may think and fall under the the, 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 uh, false pretense of Jesus has saved me, I'm done. No, listen, when Jesus saves you, we're just beginning. Now we are called to walk and to look like Jesus Christ. This whole picture right here comes from Isaiah 25, where Isaiah refers to the culmination of redemptive history as a great feast. If you've got your Bibles, turn back to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 25 real quick. Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 and 9. Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 9 says this. Isaiah, and we've been in Isaiah in our readings. You may have gotten there by now in this. Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. Isaiah's writing, he says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food, full of marrow, of aged wine, well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people. He will take away... He will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Listen, did you see all the foods that are going to be there? This feast that we have, this feast, there's going to be, uh, it's beyond imagination what it's going to be. He puts in there that you're going to see meats and fruits and vegetables and wine. It's, there, there's going to be, I imagine, the greatest of desserts that you think of. All of this, though, as great as this feast is going to be, as you think back on the feast or the whatever it was that you had at your wedding, whatever it was at your ceremony, what. It's all going to pale in comparison. You think about the greatest dinner that you've ever had, the amount of money that you paid for it. I need you to know that our groom laid his life down. It, it, this feast cost him his life, and he has called us to it. And you know what the greatest part of this feast is going to be? That the groom is there, Jesus 
Yes, there's going to be food. It's going to be incredible. I, I can't wait. I love to eat. My body shows you that. I cannot wait to be there. But you know what the best thing is? Is Jesus is going to be at the head of the table. And we're going to cry out, hallelujah. Jesus is here, the one we have waited on. Matthew 25 and Luke 14 is the parable of the great feast of the bridegroom. The, 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 Jesus told the story, and he said, listen, there was a, a man who had a great feast. He, his son was getting married. He threw a great feast. He sent out his servants into the land to go and send out the invites. He was speaking of Israel. And he says, listen, Israel, they said, no, we don't have, we, we don't have time. We don't have time. You know why they didn't have time? Because they were lounging with the prostitute, the spirit of Babylon. We don't have time. They came back and reported. You know what, what happened then? Then the master of the house sent out, and he said, listen, I need you to go, and you go to the highways, to the, to the hedges, to the byways. I don't care if they're bad, they're good. You bring them in. The scripture tells us that he clothed those who came. He gave them the wedding garments to, can, to come. That's what was their entry, was the wedding garments. The scripture even tells us that he told his servants, he said, listen, if anyone comes in here and they're not dressed for the wedding, we're throwing them out. We're casting them out. Folks, I need you to hear this. Today, Jesus wants to close you with his righteousness. The scripture tells us that blessed are those who are invited to the supper, to the supper. And my question for you is, are you invited to the supper? I've got news for you. You are. The question will be, will you take the invitation? And will you accept the invitation so that you are there? Because if you're not clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his crucifixion, his perfect life lived out, him laying his life down on a cross, him being put in a borrowed tomb and rising again three days later, him being ascended back to heaven. If we do not submit our lives to that Savior, to that groom, I need you to know we won't be a part of the bride. You're not a part of the bride. And today, we're calling you. I'm pleading with you. I'm imploring you. The Holy Spirit's already been moving in this place today. And for some of you in here, you have felt that stirring. That's not good words from an East Texas pastor. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And the question is, is will you surrender and accept the gift that he's offered to you right now? The invitation has been extended to you. Church, I need you to hear. Those of us who are already a part of the bride, did you realize that we have a responsibility to live up to the clothing that we have been given? And I need you to hear me. We can't. Even though we have the responsibility to live like our King Jesus, we can't do that. That's why we continually run back and fall at his feet and say, I need grace. His steadfast love and mercy, his grace is ever abounding. I can't tell you how many times this week I've had to go back and say, God, it's me again. Me did it. Forgive me. I'm coming back to you. Thank you that you never turned your back on me you didn't kick me out of your house. God, thank you that you lovingly allowed me to be a part of your family. I surrender. I admit, I confess that my way is not your way. Did you realize that prayer applies to those of you who have never surrendered your life to Jesus and in, pray, in praying and asking him, God, I, I need your forgiveness You know, this leads us into communion. You know, the only people who get to go to the wedding ceremony, the feast, the banquet, are those who have been invited. They're the only ones. And I need you to know that communion are for those of us who have followed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you've not followed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'd ask you just to hold on to this. I'd love to talk to you about that. If you're in here today and you do not have one of the communion cups, would you raise your hand? We want to make sure that you get one. If you're a follower of Jesus, you do not have a communion cup, raise your hand. Somebody's going to bring those to you right now. Brandy, do you have those? Yeah, thank you very much. Y'all get those around, please. Right back here. Any of 
I'm all right. You know, a good old East Texas wedding is the, the, the rehearsal dinner usually has barbecue. That's what we had at mine. So it was a good old East Texas wedding. You know, what, you know what the rehearsal dinner is, don't you? It gets you ready for the day, the next day, where the feast is going to happen, where the big celebration is going to happen. Your communion is much like that. This is kind of like the preparation. Uh, the cracker, it's not much. It's grape juice, it's not much. It's not choice meats and fruits and fresh bread and fine wine. But this right here is designed by God to whet our appetite, to remind us that he's laid his life down for us. It's to remind us of his presence in our life. It's to remind us that he's here right now with us. His spirit is here. You realize wherever his spirit is, there is fullness of joy, David said. Today, you may be thinking, I don't know if I'm full of joy. My prayer, our prayer right now is going to be that if you're a follower of Christ, that you would begin to experience the fullness, His fullness of joy. In this little wafer that is to symbolize His body, this little sip, that reminds us of his blood, his sacrifice for us. I'm going to ask that we take just a moment with just the piano there. I'm going to ask that you just sit in silence for a moment. And you go before the Father. And if there is anything that you need to confess to him, and when I say confess, God, I, I, I turn back to you. Would you do that right now? Scripture tells us that on the night that Jesus was with his disciples in the upper room for Passover, he took the bread, took it out, he broke it, he passed it around to his disciples, and he said this, he said, this is my body. I'm redefining this Passover meal. This is my body, broken for you tonight, today. We take it, and let's eat together. In the same way, he took the cup. And he said, hey, guys, this is now representative of my blood. The blood of the new covenant. My blood that will be spilled for you. Scripture tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There's no forgiveness. There's no, nothing can happen. Bulls and goats and turtle doves. Goats, it cannot do it anymore. Well, now it is Jesus Christ and his blood spilled for you and I. Take it, and let's drink together. Father, we love you, and we honor you. We thank you for your presence. We say hallelujah to you. We magnify you today. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray these things today. And will all God's people say hallelujah? Hallelujah. hallelujah. Zeke? Come and lead us.